and we encourage everybody to keep the video on. Uh, so indeed, your screen is not going to be recorded uh, unless you'll ask a question. Um, and if you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature that you will see in the menu. Otherwise, that's about it. And you can, of course, stay back after the coffee break, after the talk, if you want to talk to Pierre. Okay, Pierre, I think uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you, uh, Krishna, for uh, the introduction. And um, I also thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so just as a small disclaimer, um, mute. thank you. Um, a small disclaimer, uh, I've already done this presentation a few times, so maybe you've already seen it. So there's not, there's basically nothing new uh, since uh, the first time I gave it. So if you're hoping for this, um, well, it's not going to happen. Okay, but I think um, some might not have seen it. So uh, that's really for you. Okay, so this was a joint work with, uh, oh, and also do you see my cursor? Yes, okay, good. So this was a joint work with uh, Thomas Colcombe and Nathanael Fijalkov. Um, yeah, uh, let's go. Uh, so first the outline of the talk. So I'll introduce a problem on uh, MDPs. Um, I will not assume anything known. Uh, we'll toy around quite a lot with examples um, to see that the problem is, is uh, interesting. Um, we'll, uh, then I'll give an, an overview of the proof. So actually, I, I will go into quite some details. I think um, this is going to give really a, a good idea of what's in there. Um, and then I, I'll discuss a bit of future work. So uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, it's probably for the best if you have a question. Um, yeah, so I'll try to keep an eye on the chat um, or otherwise uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, okay, so first the problem. So uh, we're working with an MDP uh, M. Um, so an MDP is a transition system that's displayed like this. Usually you write probabilities in there. So for instance, it could be A with a third and maybe this other A here has probably two thirds. Okay, actually it's going to turn out that in this problem, the exact probabilities don't really matter. So just think of uh, all actions to be equiprobable. So for instance, if I'm in state S and I'm playing action A, there is a half probability to take this transition and half probability to take this transition. Okay. Um, okay, so first let's um, play around a bit. Um, so first question would be, uh, if, if I put a token on some state and I act uh, as the controller to this MDP, so I can play some actions, uh, is it possible to almost surely uh, get one token from this state S to this state T. Okay, in this example, I claim that uh, it's always possible. So what's the strategy? Well, just play A again and again. At some point, you know that this token is going to reach the second state and then play action B. And if you're lucky, your token will get to the target. If you're unlucky, then you have to start again. But to repeating this process, eventually you'll be lucky and end up with the token in the target. Okay, so for this, so this would be a yes uh, instance to this question, right? And in general, how would you solve this question? Well, really the kind of textbook approach to uh, almost sure reachability on an MDP uh, is reducing to a Buffy game. So I want to give some details about how this works because it's uh, going to be generalized afterwards. Um, so the Buchi game uh, says that you can uh, choose the action and the transition, but you have an opponent who uh, can interrupt you. If the opponent interrupts, um, then he chooses uh, another transition, but with the same action. Okay. And now I'm saying it's Buchi because the opponent is only able to interrupt finitely many times. So at some point, he should let, let you do whatever you want, okay? Um, 
And I claim that this is equivalent. I don't want to completely prove this, but I think it's somewhat intuitive. So in this example, uh, what I would do in the Bushi game is, of course, choose this transition A. And if I'm interrupted, then it's not too bad because I would remain in this state. At some point, I won't be interrupted. I can reach this. And then I, I'm going to play this transition here with action B. And if I'm interrupted, again, I can recover from this. So eventually, I, I will stop being interrupted, and I, I will win the Bushi game. And these two problems are equivalent. Now, solving the Bushi game on some finite system is, is uh, decidable. I only care about decidability, but it's polytime. OK. Question. Um, In this model, evidently, it's required that you can observe the state you are in. Absolutely, yes. This is very important. Uh, we'll actually discuss briefly what happens if you cannot observe. But yes, I have full observation on uh, the evolution uh, of the position of the tokens, and this is very important. OK, another question. Uh, let's fix some number of tokens, say four tokens. Uh, put them on the source. And then same question, can I put all the tokens uh, from the target, okay, with some fixed number uh, four tokens. Okay, now um, for the dynamics of what happens when I have several uh, tokens, um, it's really as a controller, I act globally on the system. So I play one action and each token chooses a transition. Okay, so if there's some token in the first state and some token in the second state, and I play action A, then tokens that are on the second state will remain on the second state, and maybe some tokens from the first state will reach the second state. Okay, now I claim that basically with the same strategy, you're going to be able to get these four tokens from S to T uh, by playing action A again and again until all tokens are in the second state, and then playing action B. And if you're not, if you're kind of lucky, some tokens will reach T, and then this is a sync, so you can interact. Okay. Um, now, what would be this textbook proof for uh, solving this problem with some fixed number of tokens? Well, you can just look at n tokens running on one MDP as just some kind of product token running on a product MDP, right? Um, and then solve the same question on, on this MDP M to the N, where states are just represented by uh, uh, tuples of uh, position for each token, right? And then use the same algorithm as, as before. Uh, so solving the Buchy game, and this gives you decidability. Okay, this is one way to solve it. Now, finally, uh, the question of interest is, um, I start with, uh, let's say arbitrarily many tokens. So I start with some finite number of tokens, but the question is, is it true that for any number of token, uh, you can with probability one synchronize them in the target, okay? And also uh, this does not really make a difference, but it makes it simple to think about it. We will assume that the target is always a sync. So whenever I can synchronize one token, uh, then I'm, it's, it's going to stay synchronized, OK? Um, so to rephrase this, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm going to say it again. What I mean is, is it true that the previous question is true for any large number of token? So for any fixed n, uh, does there exist a strategy for the controller uh, that uh, puts all the token in the target uh, with probability 1? And our result is that this problem is decidable. Um, OK, so some context, motivation, and related work. So basically, the problem comes from this uh, 2017 paper uh, by uh, Bertrand, Devascar, Genet, Jambert, and uh, Godbol, um, where they ask the same question, but uh, with an NFA uh, as a transition system. So this means that I. Um, as the controller, I choose an action, but then I have uh, the tokens uh, move non-deterministically. So you could think of this as adversarial uh, situation where uh, the tokens, uh, they, they choose where to move, but we don't have this stochastic uh, setting. So the, the difference here is that in the NFA, I, don't, um, I cannot claim that eventually I will be lucky. 
So for instance, in the previous example, in an NFA, well, maybe the tokens, they always choose action A and I cannot synchronize them in the target. Okay. Um, so this was uh, solved for NFA. And uh, in this paper, uh, they asked the question, what about uh, replacing NFA with MDP? That is uh, adding actually probabilities. And they say that it's a challenging open question. Um, the motivation um, for this paper comes from uh, actually biology, um, where, um, so let's say that you have a bunch of molecules, uh, a big number of molecules uh, that uh, all, that can be in some states, uh, and then maybe they can react to some drugs. Oh, it seems like you lost the video, or at least let me, Maybe, can, can you see me? Because I cannot see myself anymore. Um, uh, no, we can't see you, Pierre. Yeah, let me try to, is that yeah, now fine? We okay. Yeah, now we can. Ah, it stopped again. Okay. Seems to be like hardware stuff. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, so let's say you have a bunch of molecules that can change states and you can apply some drugs to them. So these would be the actions. And when you apply a drug to your solution, well, all the molecules change according to some transition probabilities. And uh, so this, this has application uh, in this sort of uh, settings. And uh, actually, uh, as, as is mentioned in the, in the original paper, well, um, the stochastic setting is a bit uh, more coherent with the application than the NFA adversarial setting. Um, this has um, similarities with uh, many other models. So there's this well-known model of uh, population uh, protocols where you also study evolution of many agents, um, but the dynamics is different. Uh, in population protocols, most of the time it's really two agents that interact and then uh, change states as a result of this interaction. Um, in this sense, we're somehow closer to broadcast protocols, which also have been studied, where, uh, so this, I think, I'm, I'm not an expert in these models, but I think broadcast protocols, uh, they generalize population protocols with uh, additionally, um, uh, it's possible that an agent can broadcast a message to all other agents, and then all agents will uh, change state uh, according to this. So this is very similar to our, um, to our model, but broadcast protocols are more general. And so the problems that are posed are, are not the same. For instance, um, a lot of, so in this paper, uh, it says that a lot of problems in broadcast protocols are actually undecidable. Uh, because it's it's a uh, more general than our framework, um, and now also this uh, probabilistic automata. So it's kind of close to this. It, probabilistic automata correspond to the setting where you don't observe where the token goes. So let's say you have one token and and you just in advance give a word of action. Say I'm going to play A B B A B C. And then there's probabilities that my token is gonna end up here or there. And this really corresponds to probabilistic automata. And now, um, now uh, the close problem to what we're doing would be the value one problem in probabilistic automata, which says, um, uh, can I achieve a probability as close to one as possible? Now, the difference with our problem is that you don't get to observe the system. So you will you have to play in advance a word such that with good probability, the token is going to end up uh, uh, stabilized. And it's really, uh, so in this sense, it's different. And actually uh, the value one problem in probabilistic automata uh, was shown to be undecidable. So in some sense, by uh, having this observation, we recover uh, decidability. Uh, okay, so let's do some more examples. Uh, so this we've already seen. Um, now there's something I wanted to observe, which uh, I didn't say yet, is that in, in our strategy where we uh, play action A until all tokens are in the second state and then play action B, 
uh, if we started with n tokens, what's the expected time in our strategy uh, to put all the tokens in the target? And I claim that this is going to be log square n. Why is this? Well, uh, the first step of putting all the tokens in the second step, uh, state well, takes roughly log n time, because at each uh, step, we're going to uh, cut into the number of remaining tokens in, in the state. Okay, uh, And then when we play action B, well, same thing. Uh, we're going to put half of the tokens in the target, and half are going to go back. So basically, we have in each iteration that takes time log n, we're able in, in uh, expectancy to put half of the tokens in the target. And so if we iterate this, we have log n iterations that each take log n time, so you get log square. Okay, that's just a remark, but it's going to be interesting also for rather for the conclusion. Okay, here's another example. So let me describe it a bit. Um, so you have three rounds, uh, which are really uh, the same. Uh, each round works as follows. Uh, first, you have to play action A, and then the tokens are separated between uh, the state on the top and the state in the bottom. Then you play either action U for up or action D for down, and this uh, puts all the tokens that are in the corresponding state uh, to, the, to this target. And the other tokens, so if I play action up, uh, the tokens that are in down, they proceed to the next round, okay, and vice versa. Um, and then at the end, uh, you reach a sink. So you don't want any token to end up in here because then there's no way that you can put it in the target. Okay, now what I claim is that in the three round uh, game like this, you can synchronize seven tokens. And the strategy is kind of obvious. You play action A, then you look at where's the biggest amount of tokens and you synchronize this in, in the top, uh, in, the, in the target. Okay, so here I would play up, and then here I, I would play down, and then here I would play up. And if you started out with seven tokens, then this works, right? Uh, so I, I can uh, synchronize seven tokens, but if I had eight tokens, then uh, basically I cannot synchronize them with probability one. Why is this? Well, if I'm really unlucky, uh, I play action A, four tokens go there and four go down. Right now, whatever I do, I have four tokens in the next round. Okay, so if, if I'm unlucky, uh, there's no way I can drive my eight tokens. Yeah, so I'm gonna have four tokens here. Then if I'm unlucky again, I'm gonna end up with two tokens here and, I, and then with one token in the bad uh, sink. Okay, so here I have this number eight. So yeah, you can see this somehow as a gadget that says you're able to synchronize at most seven tokens. Uh, and this it's quite clear that uh, this eight here is something that's exponential in, in the size, right? I, I could just make more rounds and have a linear number of rounds, and this is two to the number of rounds. And you can actually generalize this to have a, a doubly exponential bound here uh, with some subset construction. So, um, so basically, we're going to need to be able to deal with some large numbers. So that's something uh, that's something yeah we should know um okay here's a, i think really nice example um so again we have this uh, kind of a round here so what happens is that if i have uh, tokens in state s and i apply action b they're going to be split between the left and the right uh, state and then i should choose between left and right and some the one I choose, they go to this good state, and the other ones, they would go to the bad sink. Okay, so this gadget here uh, says that if I have uh, two tokens on S, I should not play action B, because if I play action B with two tokens on S and I'm unlucky, one token goes here and one token goes here, and then whatever I do, one token then ends up in the bad state. Okay, um, so this. This is really uh, tells you you can synchronize a token, but at most once, at most one token. And now up there, um, you have uh, some sort of accumulator. And um, so the dynamics of this is when you play action A, the tokens get shuffled around. 
So um, maybe some stay where they are and some just change uh, places. And I claim that this, uh, this is a yes instance for putting as many tokens I want from S to T, but the strategy is a bit weird. Uh, what's the strategy? Well, I would play action A again and again and again, and until I'm getting very lucky and just one token happens to be in S. And if I have a billion tokens uh, up there, well, it's going to take me a lot of time because this is uh, very uh, unlikely to happen. But at some point, it's going to happen with probability one. And then once I've succeeded in uh, isolating a token on the source state S, then I can play action B and put the token in the target. And then the rest are going to stay here and then apply this, strat this strategy again. OK, so that's kind of a funny example, I think. And um, here uh, you, you have, uh, so to synchronize N tokens, you have to get very lucky. And this has probability uh, one over exponential. And, and so um, now whenever you get lucky, you have one less token. So, so uh, this is only a polynomial. You need to be lucky only a polynomial number of times. So you get this uh, two to the n approximate uh, expectation for, for this uh, uh, strategy. Okay, but this is optimal. Okay, one other example uh, uh, is this one. So I did not rewrite the gadget, but it's the same as previously. I just changed the accumulator. Now accumulator works with two actions, A1 and A2. So A1 uh, puts uh, tokens uh, from, A so some tokens are going to go from the first to the second state, and then the other ones just stay where they are. And A2 is kind of a reset that says, put everything back to S, okay? Um, so what happens here? Well, I start with a billion tokens in S, and then whenever I play uh, action A1, well, half, roughly half the tokens are going to go in the second state, right? So I'm going to play A1 again and again. And at some point, I'm going to have some small number of tokens here, maybe, I don't know, five tokens. And I play A1 again. Maybe I'm left with two tokens. And maybe I play A1 again. And if I'm lucky, I end up with one token. But if I'm unlucky, well, I, my two tokens are going to go to the second state, then I have to start again, right? But with some, prob with some positive probability, which does not depend on the initial number of tokens, I'm going to get lucky. And so in log n steps, there's some positive probability that I can isolate the token here. So with this strategy, um, I have n log n expectancy here. Uh, log n is number of steps to isolate one token, and then I have to do this one by one, so I have a factor n. So that I think that's also an interesting example. And this is just one last uh, example, so sorry about all of those. Um, so here, again, I have two at most one gadgets. I did not write all the transitions, uh, but you have to believe me uh, on what happens. So basically, uh, your strategy here is as follows. So here you again have this accumulator that requires to be very lucky. So the same as uh, in this example here. Um, and now what you want to do is uh, first isolate one token. And then, well, eventually you want it to reach the target. So let's just put it there. Um, and now I would like to play action B uh, in order to put this token in the target. The thing is, action B is not defined on, on this part. So you should think of it as uh, action B goes to a bad sync state, right? So I'm not really allowed to play action B as long as there are some tokens in there. So I have my single token waiting in there. And now, in order to be able to play action B, I have to put all the tokens one by one in this state. OK, so one by one, I have to be very lucky and then put them in there. And then once all the tokens are in there and my single token is waiting here, I can play action B to put this one on, on T and then the other ones come back to the starting point. Okay, so, uh, so this is a yes instance, but the strategy is kind of involved.
which is just what I wanted to show. And again, it's some exponential. Okay, so that's it with uh, examples. I hope I got you kind of curious uh, about the problem. Um, so uh, now let's go to the decidability proof. Um, so uh, it's got, roughly there's two steps. So um, first I'm going to um, again introduce a Bushi game, which is basically the same as before. And then this Bushi game, uh, I'm going to express it as a limit of a sequence of games um, uh, indexed by natural numbers. So here again, so the Bushi game is just going to be as previously my opponent can interrupt as many, uh, so he can interrupt, but he has to interrupt finitely many times. And GI is my opponent can interrupt only I times. Okay, we're going to do the details of this. Um, then I will show that this sequence of game is uh, basically finite. I mean, at some point, uh, the winning region of the game uh, stabilizes. Okay, so this is going to be step one. And then I'm going to show that I can compute the winning region of GI plus one from the winning region of GI, assuming that I can solve some problem uh, that I'm going to introduce also, which we call the sequential for problem. Um, and then the second part is, so basically this reduces our problem to uh, decidability of this uh, sequential for problem. Then the second part uh, of the proof is uh, 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 obtaining this decidability of this uh, SFP uh, problem. Um, and for this, we're going to use uh, the theory of uh, regular cost functions. So this we'll see also. Uh, I will not assume anything now. Uh, so this is going to be kind of just a textbook and not very, not that interesting. And then this gets a bit uh, harder. Okay, uh, let's start with this, uh, with the Bushi games. Um, so let me first define this game GI. Uh, so really the point is that we want to uh, start with our stochastic game and remove the randomness, which is just as we did for the finite case uh, when we went to a Bushi game. Uh, so a configuration uh, of my game is just, it's, it's a tuple, uh, uh, like this, uh, it just tells me how many tokens are on each state. Uh, and now the evolution of the game is that uh, if, so the controller uh, chooses an action and a transition for each token, and uh, the opponent, Adam, can counter and choose any other transition with the same action, okay, for each token. Uh, so really the, the, the same game as previously. Uh, and now in GI, uh, Adam is allowed to interrupt uh, only I times. If he interrupts I plus one times, then I win. Okay, so um, yeah, I just drew a picture of a game, uh, but we've already seen that uh, I win uh, GI on, on this game. Um, Okay, now I'm gonna discuss uh, the winning regions uh, of GI when uh, I grows. Okay, so every GI has the same arena, which is NQ, the set of configurations, um, and then some extra, uh, yeah. So let's just, let's just say this, uh, the arena of GI is NQ. Uh, and now I'm going to study the, uh, how the winning region evolves when uh, I grows. So on NQ, I have a component-wise order uh, that in this setting just tells us, um, uh, so there's more tokens on each state. So uh, um, configuration is smaller than another configuration if uh, this other configuration puts more tokens on each state. Okay, so it's a partial order. Uh, now the winning region in game GI you can show that it's downwards closed. So again, this I think is quite intuitive. If I can sing, if I can put all the tokens in the target uh, from uh, some configuration, and uh, now I remove some tokens from some states, then I'm, then I'm still going to be able to put everything in the target. Okay, and now the theory uh, tells us that uh, on uh, 
So it's really that, um, yeah. It's really that NQ with this order is a WQO. Um, and then this tells us that WI, uh, you can represent it as a union of finitely many ideals. Um, okay, I don't need to go into the details of this really right now. Um, and now moreover, uh, when you increase I, well, you give more power to your opponent. He has the power to interrupt uh, more and more times. So the winning region can only decrease. So really what we're looking at is this uh, decreasing sequence of downloads closed set. And it's well known that uh, in, in this set uh, with this component wise order, well, such a sequence stabilizes. Okay, um, so, I, so it really looks like this. Now um, there's G infinity, which is the, the Buhi game where, so the opponent uh, can interrupt uh, arbitrarily many times, but on each game, it's, it ha he has to interrupt uh, uh, finitely many times. Okay, so there's not there's no bound prescribed in advance. But uh, if he does, if on a given play he interrupts infinitely many times, then he loses. So this is another game. And then um, my textbook lemma from before that I did not show is that the winning region in this G infinity is also the winning region in the game, uh, stochastic game I'm interested in. Uh, and, um, and now it's clear that uh, if there is no uh, prescribed bound on the number uh, of times that the opponent can interrupt, then the winning region, the obtained winning region should be larger than all of these. Uh, and then there's another lemma here uh, to prove that it's actually equal. So this is just some manipulation of strategies and so on. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. Um, okay, but we have this picture. Um, and now what I claim is that W0 is easy to compute. So W0 is the game where uh, there is no interruption. So I can do whatever I want with the tokens. So it's really the same as having just, uh, yes, yeah, so that's easy. And now I'm gonna, prove that if I know wi, then I can compute wi plus one. Okay, and since there's only finitely many different wi plus ones, uh, then at some point it stabilizes and I have found what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, okay, so that's done. And now this part. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce a control flow problem and then explain how this is done. Um, maybe it's going to be a bit hard to grasp. Okay, let's, we'll see. So sequential flow problem. Uh, again, I'm working with a, a finite transition system like this. Uh, again, there's some actions, uh, but the semantics is going to be different. So now I, I have colors from, for my actions. So there's blue, uh, orange and green uh, actions. Um, and um, additionally, there's some guards on the edges. So uh, when I write nothing, it means that there's no guard. So you could, uh, yeah. So, uh, and a guard means that uh, I can only pass at most one token uh, through some edge. Okay. And now uh, the, the, the big difference in the semantics is that uh, this is uh, non randomized. and as a controller, I choose where the tokens go. Okay, this is really the crucial difference. So um, yeah, so I, I pick, so I have many tokens on two. And when I play, for instance, the orange action, I choose exactly where I want the tokens to go, but it has to satisfy the guards. Okay. And then the question is going to be roughly the same. Um, but now I have to be a, a bit more precise about the question. Just let's look at this example a bit. Um, ah, I see there's something in the chat. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I thought I had one hour, uh, so I should speed up a bit. Um, okay. Um, so let's maybe just still look at this example a bit. Um, so let's say I have many tokens on state two and I want to put them in state four. Then I'm claiming I'm going to be able to do this. And the strategy is, um, well, first play the blue action, isolate one token in, in three. 
Uh, then I would want to play the green action, but the green action is not defined on two. So I'm not allowed to play it uh, while there are some tokens there. Uh, so before playing the green action, I should first play orange action many times to put all my tokens from two to one. And then finally, I can play the green action and put this token in state form. Okay, so now I'm going to have to speed up a bit. So let's skip these notations. Basically, uh, the sequential flow problem is um, you, um, so, so you see this as a transition system from a top from a configuration. So configuration tells you there's this and that number of tokens on each state. And then, uh, the, then you put an arrow between a transition and another transition if there is a way to reach this other transition, right? And then the sequential flow problem is really uh, computing the pre-star of some set uh, of some downloads closed set in this transition system. Um, okay. Um, now. Um, the claim is that uh, I'm, if, if I can compute these pre-stars, then I can compute wi plus one from wr, from wi. And um, this is because of uh, this equivalence. So uh, maybe I can uh, talk about it. Um, so if I start from a given configuration and I ask whether uh, this is winning in the game, where the opponent can interrupt i plus one times. Okay, I know that it's if it's this game, it means that I can um, play some action, and if I'm interrupted once, I know that I will always stay in. Uh, uh, I will end up. So if I'm interrupted, I will end up in a configuration where with i interruptions. Um, the opponent uh, cannot win, right? So again, uh, a configuration is winning if and only if uh, I can uh, play uh, and choose transitions in such a way that if ever I were interrupted, uh, the opponent could not lead to something uh, which uh, is winning in the game with I interruptions. And this is exactly what's written there. And this tells you that if you if you really understand the GI game, if you can compute this uh, winning region in the GI game, uh, then you can really compute the set of um, moves uh, such that an interruption cannot go to the complement of the winning region. And uh, now, if you take all these moves, this is going to be a downward closed set of moves, and then you can deduce. Um, uh, a flow system uh, that precisely uh, gives you wi plus one. Okay, uh, so that's done. Uh, and now I, uh, so I have five minutes or so, so I'm gonna just go a bit fast on this slide. So this is about how, how to solve SFP. So uh, it's a bit, um, so I think this was the most interesting slide, but okay, I'll just comment quickly. So to solve this SFP, uh, we use a lemma uh, that tells you that to compute some downloads closed set, you really only be able, uh, only need to be able to decide ideal membership. And then, so this is well known, I think, in the WQO community. Um, if you can decide ideal membership, then just enumerating ideals in, in an intelligent way, you can recover uh, the set you want to compute. Uh, now uh, I want to decide ideal membership. So I did not really define an ideal, sorry about that. Um, if I fix an ideal, uh, I can define a function uh, that takes as input words of capacity. So capacity are these actions, A, B, C. Uh, so I can define a function that takes as input a word of capacities and then outputs either an integer or infinity and really computes uh, from um, so if, if I put n tokens, uh, so let's say I have, I want to decide membership of the ideal zero omega zero zero. So the set of configurations where all the tokens are on the second state. Uh, my claim is that the, the function that tells me 
uh, given a word of capacities, the top number of tokens I can put on the omega so that uh, this word W of actions can synchronize these tokens to my target. Uh, so, so this would be uh, function phi. Uh, and this function phi is computed by some model of automaton, distance automaton. And uh, really the proof here is not too hard. Uh, it's um, that uh, what I really want to do is compute uh, max flow. And uh, max flow is the same as min cut. And you can, with a, an automaton, you can guess a minimal cut. And now it is well known that for this model of automaton, the problem of boundedness is decidable. And uh, this, uh, then I can obtain ideal membership. Uh, yeah, so sorry about being a bit fast, but uh, I want to comment on uh, future work. Um, so this proves the decidability uh, result I was interested in. Uh, now, um, if you look at complexity, so I think this sequential flow problem is really of independent interest. In particular, uh, there is what I call a simple SFP. So simple SFP, you just have one source and one target. So uh, in, in this flow, trans, uh, in a flow system, so like this, sorry. In a flow system like this, you have one source, say state two and one target, and the guards are only ones or no guard. And you ask, can I put all the tokens from uh, my given source to my given target? This is simple SFP. Um, and it's already kind of uh, a hard problem. And the bounds we have is uh, there's a p-space uh, lower bound that holds already in the simple case. And the upper bound given by our algorithm is uh, exponential space. Uh, and again, uh, even for the simple case. So uh, I think the complexity of simple SFP is uh, an interesting uh, problem which is, which is uh, open as of now. And then for the original uh, stochastic control problem, um, there's a nice uh, exponential time uh, lower bound by uh, uh, Masol, Shrimo, Amadi, and Tosca. Uh, and the upper bound we get with our proof is actually non-elementary because of this WQO uh, iteration. Uh, now, there exist some tools to uh, get upper bounds to uh, size of WQO uh, iterations. Uh, but as far as I've checked, they don't apply to this iteration, unfortunately. So um, even with a really good way of solving SFP, which we don't really have now, uh, this would still be non-elementary. Uh, so there's work here. Um, so, so there's still uh, uh, many open questions about these problems. Uh, and now another uh, interesting question is that as we've seen, uh, there's some example which have logarithmic or polylogarithmic uh, synchronizing time. Uh, this with the log n accumulator, uh, we could forge example with polynomial time. Actually, uh, you can put any degree you want here. And you can also do general exponential time um, um, expectation. Actually, you can prove that there's, you cannot do doubly exponential and so on. Uh, and now another interesting open question is, can we decide uh, which regime? And in particular, um, it would be very interesting uh, to decide the polylogarithmic regime, for instance, uh, for applications. So if you recall uh, the, um, the application in uh, biology, where you start with some number of molecules and you want to apply drugs, well, a strategy that takes uh, an exponential number of steps in the number of molecules is obviously uh, not good for this application. So the poly poly deciding polylogarithmic would be uh, actually more tailored uh, to the application. And I think it's an interesting and challenging problem. Um, so I'm done uh, on the talk and happy to take questions. Thank you, Pierre. So we can get into questions. OK. Go ahead, uh, Nicola. You can unmute yourself and ask. 
Okay, thank you very much for your talk, first of all. And then I just wonder, is it possible to express a uh, sequential flow problem as a model checking problem for mu calculus? Ah, uh, good question. Um, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, great question. Uh, I don't know, uh, but... Um, very interesting um, um, well just a, just just a short comment if it is possible then we don't need to invent a decision algorithm for this problem thank uh -huh, you uh -huh, uh -huh. sure um, maybe okay. nat can comment on this so one of my co-authors is, is in the audience um, I, I can you repeat the question the is no because of the complexity the model checking of model mu calculus. I mean, rather, what I mean is the um, the size of the model mu calculus formula would have to be exponential. Um, which, maybe, maybe, maybe. Which makes it uh, because of the p space lower bound, mm -hmm. which doesn't make doesn't mean that it's not possible. But uh, at least the formula cannot be a kind of direct translation. Sure, yes. sure, I understand it. But nevertheless, nevertheless, in this case, we don't need to validate algorithms separately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. So, Peter, you can go ahead. Thank you for interesting talk. I'm curious whether you have considered the generalization of the problem where you don't require all the tokens to be catched in the target but let's say a constant fraction yeah get 50% um, of all the tokens that's also a really interesting question and really in the sense that i think it completely uh, breaks uh, the approach i mean um so for instance, all these kind of gadgets, uh, they are really sensitive to the fact that uh, we really need to uh, put all the tokens and we cannot afford to lose any tokens. So, um, I, I th uh, so I think it's a different and also very interesting question and we haven't considered it. Thank you, because along the way i was puzzled why you were bothering about losing some tokens because i thought you had an infinite number and you just wanted to collect a fixed number in the target mm -hmm. but evidently you want to collect them all yes so, if you have a really unbounded stock and i have only a fixed limit that is another problem <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so David. Hi, I was just wondering um, what do you know about how the not the in, in cases where it's not possible to do an arbitrary number of tokens, how fast can the least number that you can't do grow with the size of the automaton? Yeah, this also so um so our solution gives a non-elementary bound, but I don't believe this to be uh, I, I don't believe that there is a non-elementary lower bound. Um, so, I mean, best I can do is doubly exponential, um, but I would uh, I would expect that uh, you cannot do uh, any worse than this. And but this would this would somehow be a breakthrough because this would give an elementary algorithm um, for the problem just fix this high number of token and, and then solve the MDP. So uh, that's also, that's open and, and very close to uh, really this question here. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, do we have more questions? Peter, do you have one more question? Peter, you have one more question. In, the, in that case, please go ahead. I'm muted. Um, I was wondering whether you could do anything starting from the non-elementary lower bounds for PetriNet reachability. Yes. Um, so, um, 
so you can somehow um, find. So we've tried. We've, we 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 haven't succeeded. Um, so there's connections with the model of Petrinets. Um, you can uh, so, for instance, SFP is uh, you can you can do simulate SFP in uh, some kind of petri net where there's a countable number of transitions, but it's hard to yeah we we uh, we are we're not able to move lower bounds uh, at least. Um, Thanks. It could be, it could be, but um, we haven't managed yet. Okay. So, do we have more questions? Um, so, if we don't have any more questions, let's thank Pierre for a nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was the dog, awesome. the dog seems really I mean, happy right? about the talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Your talk was like not just by the humans who attended this talk. Yeah. All right. So now we'll have the coffee break. So in case uh, you do not want to join for the coffee break, you can leave the call. Otherwise, uh, Pia will be around for a while if you want to talk to him. I'm going to stop the recording at this point of time.